Well, hey, everybody, we are live four minutes late with Rick Bassman and Boss Rutten. Uh, yo, Boss. Uh, <laughs> guys, we are down, or guy, everybody out there, we're down uh, two men and one woman tonight. Um, one and a half men and a woman. Yeah, yeah with Butterbean himself, right? Um, yeah. Butterbean cannot join us tonight. And, and Boston, I know, he is our, our, our do or die guy. He's always with Good us. Luck. It's just unavoidable. He sends his apologies. He wanted to be here. He will be back next week. And then our producers, the lovely Rachel Sartoris, is at a memorial tonight. And, uh, you know, that's something that Rachel absolutely, she's, she's actually running the memorial. And then uh, our other pro producer, John Pozorowski, John Paz, the two-man power trip, is at a concert, which um, caused me to text him, boss, and said, I, I didn't realize that the Backstreet Boys were back together. So um, who, who knows what uh, what John's up to tonight? Plus, you know, it's cool. I don't know if you saw the comments that have popped up already. No. We had a comment come in nine hours ago. This guy really got ahead of the game saying, how you guys know Big Herc? So someone was excited about that. And then it's like 24 minutes, 24 minutes before starting. I think it's the first time we ever got comments before the show started. 24 minutes ago, some 405 Cowboys says, What's up, Herc? I love your channel and the positivity you bring. Uh, that's cool, man. That's cool. Well, he's, uh, he's famous here also in, uh, in Thousand Oaks because, <laughs> because the Wells Fargo Bank, which is my bank, he robbed that place many years ago. Yeah. So, but yeah, we're all here from that. And, I mean, he, this guy, you know, to, to have a life like that and to wrap it around and then to come out of on top on the other side, it's so inspirational. Stuff like this, I really like yeah, yeah. I, you know, Marcus is a friend and, and has been for maybe 10, 12 years now. And he, he's such an interesting guy, man. He's known as Big Herc. Um, he doesn't mind revealing his real name, which is Marcus Timmons. Uh, it's, you know, a matter, matter of record. But he's known as Big Herc. And, uh, dude, he's a fascinating guy. The guy's been about as deep in the SHIT as anybody I know. And uh, it come out the other side. Every time you meet this guy, he's, like, so incredibly positive. But the trick with Marcus is you know it's always genuine. So, you know, it's not an act. We could all put a face on. We all know how to do that. Um, it's genuine. And it's interesting to, to think for a second about where he was and what he came to when you, when you see that attitude. Pretty amazing stuff. That's, yeah, uh, that's, that's the stuff I like. You know, it's a boring life. Having a boring life, don't do anything, you know. Yeah, it's good, you know, and we need it, you know, because that means that you, you can live a great life uh, if you don't do anything crazy. But most of the time, it's... The people who went through a lot of crap, you know, and I don't mean the violence and all of that, but sickness, like you. I mean, well, what happened to you? We we're just talking about it before. You've been stabbed. You had, you had cancer. You've been shot. You I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happened to you. And look at you. I mean, you're right here. Yeah, it's pretty trippy, man. You know, we, to be honest, everybody out there. And boss, you're getting so much love in the in the chat right now. He oh. caught Chud, <laughs> Rob Hartfelt. Paul Donaldson, Ray Nichols, everyone's calling you out in such like good, positive ways. I, I love to see that love. Um, I want to bring Sean on. He, he showed up. I'm going to bring him in a minute, but I want to answer that for you real quickly, only because I'm, this is so cliche now to say I'm feeling blessed, but I'm feeling pretty good right now. As you guys know, I said here on air about five weeks ago, I was simultaneously quitting Kratom and Red Bull and Afrin. Now, I don't know if anybody considers that stuff drugs or not, but that's not a good combination of things, man. Mm -hmm. And and I was hurting five weeks ago, and for you know a month and a month and one week later, you know, I feel like a whole new person. It's amazing. And we were talking about how old we are before. I don't know if you want to announce your age or Marcus wants to announce his. I'm gonna be ten days from now. I'm gonna be sixty, and you know, that's that's old by any measure. And you know. We we're talking about, you know, living a clean life to get there. And as you said, you know, it's like I must be lucky, even though I like to bitch and complain all the time, because, you know, I have been shot. I've been styled. I've had two three year illnesses, both of which I was given a uh, terminal prognosis each time I was supposed to die. Um, you know, I've, I've lived homeless. I've lived drug addicted. I've been in tons of fights. I've drank enough alcohol to stock a Costco, probably. And somehow, man, I don't know. So. Maybe it's time to, to turn a new leaf at this point. But but the thing also, you know, with you, it's like I bet you because you really look good. There is a big difference in the way you look since last week and the week before. So it is because of the crap that you stopped then. You know, how was how was it that, like the Kratom? How because you took a bunch, right? You took like 12 oh, grams yeah, of I did. 
you know, I, I got to say something. I, I, I'm going to get on a I'm going to get on a pulpit and preach for a second. I want to say this. Nancy Reagan said it a million years ago. Don't do drugs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's like I had my long, long go round with narcotics, you know, many years ago, heroin, then cocaine. But then, you know, 10, 15 years ago, narcotic pain pills. And it's like, hey, here's this Kratom stuff. It's a miracle. You can get off uh, narcotics forever. Dude, it's just putting a Band-Aid on a wound and a pretty, pretty big wound, Kratom is itself. And now it's take psychedelics. You don't need Kratom. It's like, come on, guys. A drug is a drug is a drug. And I have friends out there that sell this stuff for a living, so they'd be pissed at me. But oh, well, sorry. Yeah, but this is the thing. You know, if, if, if alcohol for a lot of people is you know, n- not a problem. For people like us, it is. You know, and that's with any drug, you know. And Kratom does give you a good feeling. And like I told you, you know, I was using a lot, too. But I'm like two two teaspoons and a quarter. I'm taking a day, so it's like yeah. it's nothing. It's like four grams, you know, compared to guys who use sixteen or twenty grams a day. And I go, I, I didn't want to do that because I went up a little bit, and then I realized, you know what? It's the same as the pay bills if I keep doing this. I gotta stop. And then I realized that it's very easy to do half and do half of that to do half of that, and then suddenly you have the very low number. And then, bada bing, bada boom, it's good. Now it's, I think it's if I would stop it, I think. A couple of days, I think we'll be okay because it's such a small yeah. amount. Uh, yeah, it's a small amount. I had horrible withdrawals, not quite the level of uh, Vicodin or Oxy or whatnot, but it it was up there. Bobby Billers is saying Afro and Red Bull is going to speed you up. Kratom is going to slow you down. Yep. It's a heart that's going to be all jacked up. Um, it, none of it's a good mix. None of it on its own. All of it together, it's just so much better than being on nothing, man. That's yep. that's all I got to preach about that. Should um. Should we? You want to uh, introduce our uh, uh, amazing, uh, happy-go-lucky co-host uh, who's sitting here patiently waiting for us? Uh, the guy with the big day. bicep. We got to do this arm because the other arm is a really tiny arm, and, and still, my my biceps is probably as big as his uh, forearms. <laughs> Sean yeah. Ray, man, I've been talking to you about a long time. We talked. Friends of mine were bodybuilding fans in Holland all the way back, and we're talking about this '92. 91, and they were already talking about him that he was going to make a big splash on the scene. And, uh, and what do you know? I believe that year he became number three of Mr. Olympia, and that was his debut. So, uh, yeah, he's uh, very much liked by all the other bodybuilders, a really good character, really good talking, really good host, and that's what he's doing right now, bodybuilding competitions and hosting. And uh, I, it's just a, it's a heck of a guy. And with that said, the gentleman who called me out for looking at my phone during my podcast, I apologize. I'm trying to be a producer too. Sean's turned into a great producer. He's becoming a good friend. Let's bring him on, Mr. Sean Ray. Boom. Yo. <laughs> oh, Am I fitting in the screen? Yeah. yeah. You got to yeah. sit really in the middle, I realized. Right? Okay. Because I don't yeah. Know it's, a, it's show week for us. The Hawaii Classic comes up next week. I actually leave on Tuesday. So I've been extremely busy just juggling a lot of hats. And uh, we were talking earlier about the passings in our industry of of bodybuilding. And one of my guys from like the eighties used to train with the barbarian brothers, Victor Richards, Mr. Big Nigerian humongous. It came out that the guy passed away. So everyone's paying their respects right on the heels of uh, Sean Roden's passing the 14th Mr. Olympia, just a couple days back. And dude, before I come on the air, I get this notification that the dude's not dead. His daughter comes out and says, my dad's alive. What are you guys talking about? I'm thinking, how do we go almost 24 hours believing and thinking that Victor Richards at 56 years old is dead? And it, and at the end of the day, the daughter comes out and says, my dad's alive. We have yet to hear from Victor, but it, the daughter said, my dad is alive. And uh, the news out there, I mean, that's the only good news we got all day in, uh, in the sport of bodybuilding. It's been very dark for us. So. Wow, that was a big uh, thing because yeah. I got a friend of mine who told who, who texted me and says, "Hey, your co-host uh, did he pass away?" I said, "No, I'm pretty sure he didn't because we just talked to him. He thought it was you." Oh yeah, my name's Sean, right? It's somebody else, yeah. Oh, not a shot, yeah. So, uh, but then he realized, oh yeah, okay, it's the other one, and uh, but, so just, he's not that. It's been a crazy week in bodybuilding, guys. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that to hear that Victor Richards has not passed away and. And wow. uh, they're disappointed with Sean passing away. It's happening. Sure. Okay, good. Okay, so I'll make sure. Yeah. I had heard that Victor did pass, and I was going to ask you about that. I hadn't heard that he hadn't. So, no, I mean, I talked to you about looking at your phone, Rick, but, I mean, 
here it is. It's, it's right here. The daughter was quoted. I'm pleased to assure you that my father, in fact, is alive and well. An what? inaccurate Facebook post has caused a wildfire of, of false information throughout the social media and news outlets. Thank you all for your concern. My family appreciates you. Love to the bodybuilding community has shown my dad. Respect our privacy for right now. So that's that's about yeah. as good news as I've had in a long time, especially that's when I'm right. yeah, I was going to ask you what the hell is going on with bodybuilding. It's like almost passing pro wrestling now. For, We've been uh, having this discussion in the bodybuilding forums for a while now that it's happened with great frequency. The other day I was mentioning it is happening with great frequency, but because of our ages, we're all kind of similar in age. Back when we were coming up and doing the business, it, the news didn't travel fast and we had nowhere to go and talk about it. You know, you find out that someone passed, it's been three or four months and, and it's kind of, you had time to digest it. Now it's, as soon as you hear a whisper, run to social media, spreads like wildfire. And this is, you know, the poor Victor got caught up in some bad news, but yeah, it's tough right now in the sport of bodybuilding. Well, wow. let's all, uh, let's all say a prayer for our respective sports of bodybuilding for mixed martial arts, for pro wrestling for Butterbean and, and for boxing. We have uh, we have so many friends out there that are, you know, we've lost recently and many more. And I hate to say this and jinx anything, but appear to be on the verge. And uh, man, I just wish uh, I wish a turnaround for everybody. Pretty simple thing to say, but that's what I wanted to say. No, I came on late. Where is Eric, by the way? I'm sorry? Where's Butterbean? I, I'm not getting what you're saying, Sean. Oh, Butterbean, Eric. Where's he's Butterbean? Uh, he's oh, yeah, yeah. A Butterbean is... Butterbean's alive and well. I'm happy to report. Uh, yeah. He's uh Butterbean. We all know how excited he was about getting the Butterbean mobile, his big yeah. mobile home. He just did an 18 hour straight shot without stopping to uh to Texas. Okay. And he either refuses to let Libby drive or she doesn't want to drive, so it's all him. And yeah. he's he's passed out dead right now, sends okay. his apologies and his regard. But we do have another gentleman with us today who's getting a lot of comments already. Um, talk about a guy who's who's been around death and been around all kinds of god-awful, horrible things. But, I mean, he came out the other side really unlike anybody that I know. And I'm happy to say that up until about a day ago, he had a giant head full of dreadlocks, and he shaved it just for the show. Um, nice. I, I made that part up. Yeah, I go like, wait a minute. I don't remember him like that. <laughs> no, but, uh, yes. Uh, in any case, guys, let's um, you know, uh, let's bring on a guy who is, as they say in, Hol in Hollywood, a multi-hyphenate author, uh, actor, producer, uh, big social media sensation, uh, in, a, in a former life, a, a porn star, um, who's an uh, incarcerated felon for many, many years at the highest level, and now a guy who's just like killing life in such a good way and inspiring so many people on every level. Um, longtime friend of mine, and I'm sure by the time we're done today, uh, a new friend of yours, Sean and boss, and probably everybody else out there. Let's bring on Marcus Timmons, better known as Big Herc. Big Herc. Yeah. <laughs> and there hey, he is. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Nice. Thank, thank you for the introduction, Rick. Appreciate all the uh, high points there. <laughs> right. I try not to dwell too much on the other, but how do you introduce you without Marcus? If if you went in front of an audience and no one knew who you were, which is not going to happen these days, but if it did happen, how would you introduce yourself? Um, you know, just Big Herc, a guy who's a motivational speaker and someone who's overcome a lot of adversity and kind of let the crowd take it from there. I don't really tell people too much about my background. So usually after they talk to me a few times, they're like, man, I never knew you robbed a bank. Oh, dude, yeah. you never told me you did porn. Oh, man, you didn't tell me you did this. I'm like, I'm not going to tell you all about my stuff, man. You ain't told you know what I mean. I don't want to spill the beans. I just let it kind of come out. But you can Google me. Everything's on the Internet. Yeah. 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 I mean, and, and it is your YouTube show. I mean, I hear you well over half a million subscribers it's called fresh out life after prison if i'm not uh, misstating uh and not uh, you can you can see you there personally but yeah if you google big herc you got brian kessler right now as a federal correction officer has gotten a lot of insight and entertainment from big herc's youtube channel that's amazing federal correctional officer wishing you well and hoping uh he wishing you continued success outside of prison that's great man 
People are like are drawn towards you and they like you and they're rooting for you. I've always loved that about you. Well, you know, you know my whole goal with the show, um, even when we met, I kind of had it on a back burner that one day I was going to produce a show was to uh, show a, another aspect or element of, of uh, somebody who's been through the system. Because typically, you know, you have um, you have this typecast, you know, individual and you assume that somebody who's been in trouble as much as I have is not going to change. You know, they're going to continue to commit crime. You know, they're their poster board for um, recidivism. And, um, you know, a lot of kids that just have no way out. So my whole thing was to interview people and open up a, a door, but to show the positive. I mean, there's enough negative out there. You know, there's enough people on Cops and these other shows who are just going back and forth to jail. But I want to show a different aspect. And my whole thing, really, I want to prove everybody, you know, wrong. I want to show that, hey, I made some bad choices, but I'm not a bad person. Yeah, her, her, her. Can you give us some perspective? I don't, I don't know your history. Um, how long you been out? Oh man, I got out in two thousand eight. Okay. Um, for, for for bank robbery, I had one hundred twenty months. I did eight years, eight months from that federal bank robbery, and um, man, just you know, took that time, rehabilitated myself as far as mentally. And, um, you know, found some spiritual insight in prison of who I was because I didn't know who I was. And um, I tried to take those lessons that helped me become a better person. And I put them into a lot of my interviews. Um, I'm fresh out when I interview people. A lot of times these guys aren't used to talking. These yeah. guys have maybe a side of their personality that they really lock down, that they don't open up with. So I try to bring these people who are hardened you know, ex-criminals and show that they're the softer side. And also kids can relate because what's being projected right now with the narrative is that prison is cool. You go to prison, these guys are in prison and it's accolades. And if you're a kingpin, dude, I'll tell you right now, there's guys who would give up all the money in the world to get freedom again. You know, doing yeah. 30 years in prison, doing a hundred, I've met guys with five lives plus a hundred years. Dude, 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 never coming home. They're yeah. never coming home. I mean, I seen guys in there fighting for their life to try to get out of a conspiracy. And it's just sad that just like how I was trained or conditioned that, you know, that could be, that was just like a, uh, almost like a rite of passage in life to a degree. You could flip that and a rite of passage could have been becoming a stockbroker, becoming a real estate broker, becoming an engineer, becoming, you know, a, um, a mathematician. There are so many other things, but we, we follow programs and prison is a program. And the biggest thing that I learned in prison was not to become part of that program. Mm -hmm. And they call it institutionalized. And a lot of people even institutionalized on the street and they don't know it, but institutionalized is when what everybody else is wearing, like, Almost like that um, electric company, some, one of these kids is not like the other, and this kid over here is doing something, and the other kids, the three kids are doing this. I was that kid doing the other. Guard used to trip off of me because I never adhered to the prison code. I didn't, I didn't call myself an inmate. I didn't call myself a convict. You know, I, I didn't walk around, all oh, this and that, and it threw people off. And because of how I articulate myself, a lot of guys used to look at me like, hey, man, where are you from? Oh, I'm from California. Man, what you in here for, man? Credit card fraud? Nah, man, I, bank robbery. Oh, you was one of those note robbers, huh? I said, nah, man, I wasn't a note robber. You had a pistol? Yeah, I had a, I had an M1 carbine. I, a ski mask, hostile takeover, high-speed chase. I ran across the freeway, spike strip. Oh, man, why are you always reading in the law library? I'm reading because I'm trying to see if there's a law that can benefit me. Maybe I can get out a day early. Well, man, you did the crime, right? Yeah, man. Why don't you just do your time? I'm telling you, why don't you do your time? <laughs> That's how ignorant people are in prison. Pr prison, dude, beyond the physical part, none of us would have problems. It's the ignorance. The mentality is so yeah. dumb beyond anything you can ever imagine in there. The most ignorant people, man, 
Dude literally wants to fight me because I'm studying law to try to figure out how to get out early. That's the type of stuff we have going on in there. Rick is white, I'm black. If I'm hanging out with Rick, why are you hanging out with that white guy? Well, that white guy's teaching me law. Man, you better watch out. That white guy is crazy. I would get that. One of my mentors was white. If you, you can't even come together in prison when you're being oppressed to find something to help you because ignorance is a bliss in there. Yeah. It's, it's madness, man. And that was the hardest part was basically I felt like I was a lone wolf trying to find another lone wolf who maybe could understand that I could have conversation with and and and, and, and kind of navigate through this hellhole. Because yeah. hellhole, I went to Long Park USP. Hellhole, they call it Castle Grayskull. People getting stabbed, guards is running up to people's cells at night, tying people up, people disappearing. You know, you see a dude and then he disappears. You never see him again. It's, it's this madness, man. And and like, it, it's so, the mentality is horrible. And I had to admit, I, my whole thing is keeping my sanity. I didn't want to become an animal, man. Herc, how, how, how old are you, Big Herc? How old are you? 48. So I'm 56. Um, you're my first bank robber I've ever talked to. I've been around the block for a long time. I've seen a lot of things. I've never met a bank robber. How do you wind up sitting down with your friends or by yourself? Maybe you can walk backtrack and bring us to this point. Is it a point of desperation or is this a point of cleverness or is this an, an opportunity? I mean, obviously it has to be thought about and planned out, but what takes you to a place? And, and some, of, some of the other addicts we've had on our show, uh, my brother passed away lifelong drug addict at 50, 52 years old. I know what drugs do, but like what takes you to the place where you go, okay, I'm putting on the mask and I'm going in. Like you find yourself there. How do you get there? Are you, are you desperate for the money? Is it the act? Is it the idea that you're going to get away with it? I mean, how do you get there? Um, you, you know, man, it, it's crazy because I never did drugs, man. I never smoked weed. I didn't drink. I've always been sober. I've always been the type of dude, if I'm going to bust your head, I'm going to do it sober. I never had to have any drugs to make me get courage. But I had, you know, up until that point, been, you know, looking for something to validate myself. And I think that came from, at a young age, I had a shitty stepdad. And this dude was a piece of shit. And so it took me years to even figure out who I was as a person. When you stripped up from a kid at a young age and he's in fear and then he tries to figure out like how does he establish his his uh his status in society or culture i gravitated toward things looking for other strong males street dudes dudes who hustle dudes who were killers dudes who pack pistols so i ran the gauntlet trying to find things even though i was smart i was a student 4.0 i wasn't a dummy you know, I got good grades in school. Um, my mom, you know, did her best. And she wasn't a crackhead, wasn't on drugs. You know, I was in, I grew up in pretty decent environments, but there was a window there where I was exposed to some things. So leading up to what you're saying, I had already been to juvenile hall for selling crack. I had been to uh, CYA for getting involved in a, in a home invasion. And, but I still had it had that mentorship or found what I was searching for. So I still had that kind of that gangster streak in me where I was trying to, I was still like, okay, I can still put in work. And mm -hmm. for myself, it was always about, you know, proving myself and letting people know that I, I'm not a pushover. And even it came a time when I turned 18 and I found that guy who used to be my stepdad, I confronted him in a gas station in Sacramento and I was going to bust his head. And he looked at me, he acted like he didn't know me. And I looked at him in the eyes to see if he was trying to pretend or whether or not he recognized me. Because I always said, when I got older and I, I started working out young, looking at your pictures, bro, I used to watch, look at all the muscle and fitness, look at you competing against Lee Haney and and and, and, um, and uh, Rich Gaspari, Lee Lebron. I, I used to want to be a bodybuilder. And I said, when I get big and get some size on me, I'm going to beat this dude's ass. And he, he bowed down. And I realized at that point that, I have surpassed him, but I was still searching. So I was still willing to take chances and risk and do things that compromise myself, put myself at risk. So 
living in LA. I wasn't in a bad place. I was living off of Beverly Glen and uh, Peak and like Wilshire between Wilshire and Peak. Nice neighborhood. Nice. You know, beautiful place. Uh, had a you know Range Rover, wasn't doing too bad with you know in the porn industry doing my thing, making a little money, you know, still doing dirt. I would you know I ain't gonna lie, I was you know robbing dudes and on the weekends in Sacramento, coming back to LA. I was doing a lot. Of, I still had a gangster mentality. Had a pistol, sold drugs. Was still kind of gr- in the streets, but in LA I was a different person. And so when the opportunity came from a guy in the industry, porn industry, like, hey man, you ever thought about robbing a bank? I'm like, well shit. I've done all this other shit. Why not see if I can get away with this too? You know, I'm a <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a true gangster. I wasn't, if a dude confronted me on the street, I didn't back, I was, I wasn't running. If you did something, you think you, I was going to, I would lay in the bushes for hours and catch, you, you're not going to, you're not going to get one over on me. So I figured, what the hell? I was still a gangster, but this was all ego. You know, it wasn't the real me. I have so much more potential. And in my mindset at that time, I just, I, I don't know. I was very vulnerable because I was always I was looking for a lick. If you said you have somebody that had ten birds, where they at? Let's 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 see how we can get them. I was one of those type of dudes. Mm. And so the bank robbery, I would never tell anybody to do a bank robbery. So many more things you could do in life, man. So many more. I I mean, dude, I it, it's just it's not like the movies. And there's people that's gotten away with it, and they still got caught years later. It yeah. doesn't matter. Still gets caught. Yeah, I know a guy who got away for a year and a half, nine hundred thousand, got caught a year later, so, yeah. you know, twenty years. But anyways, planned the bank robbery, um, bad idea, and there were signs. You know, you get signs that the universe tells you, or you know, God, or whoever you want to say tells you, gut feeling where you you know that it's not a good idea. Yeah. The two guys I robbed the bank with. They go to check, we go to check out the bank, right? These guys drive by the bank and then on the way to leave, going back, these the guy wants to pull over to get some chocolate. So these guys start arguing over pulling over by a gas station in the area, risking getting on camera, and they're arguing about chocolate. And I'm sitting in the back seat like something out of a movie. It's like reservoir dogs. I'm like, this shit is crazy, man. These dudes are arguing about chocolate. This guy said he needs chocolate. This guy said he doesn't need chocolate. And I'm like, dude, just get the hell out of this area, man. What are you guys doing? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, man, I'm like, this, God, this is stupid, man. But I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm a gangster, man. You know, I can pull it off still. And, you know, these guys weren't from my neighborhood. They weren't, you know, really street dudes. So, you know, it was, like I said, I, I felt that was one instance. The next instance, after seeing all this and having certain butterflies and, you know, little signs, the morning of the bank robbery, my mom calls me. Seven of them, was, she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, damn, what are you calling me this early for? I'm like, well, I'm sitting here. I got an army fatigue. I'm waiting to go get picked up to go rob this bank. But I didn't tell her that. We were actually talking about The Bachelor. She's like, oh, did you watch the finale last night? I'm like, oh, you know, I've seen some of it, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting there. My mom is, that's an angel. She was telling me, you know, what are you doing? And I overlooked it, man. So there were signs that were telling me, stop, turn, change your direction. But I was hard headed, man. I was hard headed. And I, I hadn't, I hadn't had that yoke crack yet. Yeah. And um, worst day of my life, bro. Um, you know what I mean? Um, you know, that rain, it was raining, traffic, you know, just didn't feel right, man. You just, and nobody, you know, it's quiet, man. The ride on the bank ride, the, the ride to the bank from Beverly Hills. I'm leaving goddamn West LA, nicest area, one of the nicest areas in LA, heading to go rob a bank. And I'm sitting there and um, it's quiet. Nobody's talking. And uh, we pull up to the bank. And it's like you can hear your heartbeat. You can hear everybody's heartbeat. Right. I'm in the back seat. Um, and I'm sitting there thinking, man. And then I just pull the maps down and I jump out the car and run up to the run inside the bank. And I'm like thinking the other dude's gonna follow, and he follows me. And uh, dude, I secure the bank, and he runs in there, jumps over the counter, and dude, it's like. 
your 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 heart's got the your heart's about to burst through your chest, bro. It's beating so hard, and you're looking at the clock, and you can see the seconds ticking, and you know this dude is yelling, and you can't really hear. It's like everything's like almost echoing, like you're like you know you're you're looking like, dude, what am I doing? You can't go back. You can't go get in the car. Hey, yeah. sorry about that. Retake. I'm gonna go home. Sorry, hey, everybody. Go back to normal. It's already done. I look outside the window, I see a sheriff in a yellow raincoat with a shotgun before we eat, or, or, while all this chaos is going on. I, I like, I knew it's a wrap, man. My life, I'm done, bro. You know, bank rock, I didn't even think about the time. You know, that's one thing, you know, I didn't even think about, um, you know, you know, what can really happen? You know, what, what if you had, what if somebody got shot? What if, you know, you had to shoot. You know, I didn't think about all that. How, if you got caught, how much time? That's how stupid and ignorant I was as far as the situation. Not really thinking. And, um, dude, you know, this guy's talking. It's crazy. I'm telling him to hurry up. He jumps back over the counter. The car pulls back around. We run out. I, you know, I jump in the car. We're out in the car, and the guy's like, where is he at? He runs out after me, jumps in the car. We pull out. Soon we're pulling out. I don't know if it was the cop was already knew or was was this timing. He bumped us. Oh, we're shit. in a white four door escort. He bumps us, and high speed chase is on. Instantly, game game over. Yeah, high speed chase. He chases us. We pull up into a like a little parking lot, and I'm like, God damn, dude, this is it. I mean. And the guy cop draws down on us. Get out the car. Get out the car. And we're look. We're sitting. Looking, how many man. police, Marcus? Huh? How many police? How many police? At this point, it was only one. He was the first wow. one on the scene. Did you know how much money? Do you know how much money you guys walked out with? Not at that time. We didn't. We didn't, we didn't get to count it. You just got a bag. You yeah. Got a bag, bro. It, it wasn't even no money, man. I mean, yeah. If you think about it, I mean. In the movies, bro, and you do the math, you're like, God damn, bro, you, you'd be better off uh, fucking selling Working at at Walmart. You know I mean? Yeah. Horrible. Hindsight's 2020. I imagine, I imagine sitting in a cell, it made it very clear for you. Uh, but it sounds like it was a series of events leading up to this big event since you were already going up north, ripping people off, and doing all those other things, right? Was this a culmination of all the things that you had been doing all your life? You're exactly right. And it wasn't the bank robbery that got me locked up. It was everything else catching up. Yeah. That was just the catalyst, the bank robbery. Yeah. Everything else would have caught up one way or the other. See, that that bank robbery, if it wouldn't have happened, it would have been something else possibly. It you know dead. I mean? So yeah. that was just the catalyst, man. And I tell people, they're like, oh, man, I got caught doing this, selling drugs. I didn't even have no drugs. No, nah, but you, you shot a dude. You robbed a dude. You... You 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 did this to this dude. All yeah. these other things you got away with. Yeah. So you're here not for what you did. You're here for what you didn't get caught for. And yeah. I realized that, man. And I owned up to it. I didn't. I didn't go to prison. And goddamn government. Black man can't do nothing right. Oh, man. Blah 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 blah. Man. I I sat there and I really thought, like, how did I get here? Yeah. What was the first thing that led to me going from being a 4.0? Want to be skateboarder, you know, Steve, Steve Cavallaro, Rob Roscoff, to wanting to be a thug. What was that? And I, I had to reverse all that. I had to basically go back and do a regression and meditate. And, and you know, that's what helped me rebuild myself <laughs> as a person. And that's one of the things I did in prison, man. But both of my co-defendants are dead, man. One guy, oh, oh. One got lupus. He died right after he got out, did his little five years, got out. The other one, he did seven, 15 and uh, 17, 16 years, got out, living on Skid Row, got shot five times by LAPD. Oh, yeah. but okay, let's go back to the thing. What what happened? So there was one officer. Is did he secure you all or this okay. time more? So the one officer, right, he 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 draw down on us. We're sitting there. This is all happening in microseconds. The guy, the driver punches it, drives past the cop, uh, drives into another area. We got to get, we have a second car, Lincoln Navigator. We drive in, but it's, it's like right in the general area. We jump in, we, we change clothes, 
we get in the Lincoln Navigator. By this time, it's probably 15, 20 com helicopters. The, the, the area swamped. So we're sitting there and we're thinking, man, but we got to pull out of there. Now, instead of maybe jumping off and taking off on foot, we, we were in the getaway car and we pull out. Now we pull out, there's cops all down the street and it's early in the morning. So this little, almost like a, you know, one of those dental centers where they have different uh, offices, dental, medical, we pull out of that plaza and, the, and the, one of the cops makes eye contact and he sees three black guys or two guys in a navigator like in this area and there's been a report of a robbery, we're automatically suspect. Booyah, high speed chase and Lincoln Navigator. So we have an army of cops behind us. Prop, I don't know, man. I, I couldn't count, you know, 20, 30. I mean, there's cops, man, Every, all of Ventura County. And we're rolling on the freeway. Raining, you can't see, it's coming down. Finally, uh, they throw a spike strip. They run over the spike strip, and uh, now we're just going until the car won't go no more. We're still rolling. So we're still rolling on just rims. And when the car finally comes to a stop, he's like, man, I'm going to stop the car and I'm just going to stay here and, and get arrested. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I'm about to bail. They stop the car. They, they send the canine unit right into the car. The canine unit, they send the canine. Before the canine gets to the car, I'm out of the car, over the center divider, running across five lanes of highway on a one-on-one. I run up an embankment and I'm trying to find a place to hide, but there's nowhere to hide. So oh, I'm looking around. I run to the boardwalk. I get arrested on Ventura Boardwalk, and I just get on the ground. There's probably seven, eight cops. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. The last thing I see is the Pacific Ocean, and I just cuff up. I'm on my stomach. I cuff up, man. Well, that probably saves your life, actually, going to prison at that stage because you had time to kind of reflect on how you wound up there. But I think I'm a little curious about the whole porn thing. I've also never known a porn person that got paid like how long was this how do you wind up doing that i understand maybe uh butterbean said he had a sex edition but how do you wind up like getting paid to do this did you have like a pimp if you're if you're the, the porn how does it work well the porn industry man that came about when i went to ya i was 18 so i was in cya and then i went to fire camp from 18 to 21 and that's the height of your testosterone you know you're you're, you're, you know, you're usually hooking up with chicks. You know, I was going to college at the time, so I missed out. And so the whole time I was in there, all I did was work out, um, you know, read, and of course look at, look at, you know, penthouse hustler, anything we can get our hands on. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, well, man, if I'm a bodybuilder, and then I, I mean, I can go and do porn. I can be a bodybuilding pimp. I can be sold and hook with all these chicks, make money. I'm thinking it looks like there's like, you know, some money there. And I found out that in porn, you don't make a lot of money. And yeah. it's really, you know what I mean? It's really is it like an A rate? Is it, is it like a day rate? Because you're not getting residuals on visuals. Yeah. Right? Like, exactly. Like like huh? you know, I was excited initially just to get into the business, but I realized you can't make a living doing that. And most of those guys are broke. I mean, when I got into the business, there was no internet. It was back in 1990. Four and back then you had to go to one of those little seedy little places in in in, in uh, Hollywood and go meet a director like Boogie and I. He's like, okay, get wood. You get wood. You know, boom, take a picture. We're gonna call you. And now people would look at your and a photo album would look at your picture and pick you to do scenes. And back then guys were making hundred bucks. That's it. Bucks, wow. two fifty bucks. It was no money. I mean. Everybody thought, you know, you see those guys, you know, Ron Jr., all these different dudes, and dude, they, you weren't, there was no big money. I mean, it was basically you sweating, I mean, performing. I mean, back then, you were, there was no Viagra, no Cialis, no Levitra. You had to be a straight, you know, uh, they call it a coxman. And on <laughs> demand, you had to first do all your steals and then go back and do the scene and have a microphone over your, your 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 butt your butt and you know big cameras and lights and dude it was crazy. How many people are watching you when you're working? Oh my god, bro! You you might be on a set. <laughs> there could be eight people. Man, there could be two makeup, three cameramen, <laughs> uh, uh, two light guys, 
uh, uh, a fluffer. Uh, <laughs> I, was uh, gonna ask that. I mean, dude, and then Rick, you got a guy, Rick, Rick. 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 guy. He's the guy, if you can't make Rick. it, he's like, hey, man, are you having wood problems? He's a stunt double. So then if you don't make it, everybody's like, oh, man, that guy, he, he fed, you know, your worst friends and you can't get no work. So you're only as good as your last shoe. Wow. Get, it, it, very scandalous game, man. And I was one of the best guys in shape, so I always had people <laughs> gunning for me. Did you ever fall, like, for one of the girls that you're working with? Like, she becomes your girlfriend or something? Or? No, you, you know what? That One of the things, because me, man, I always, see, outside the business, I always got a lot of, I always got a lot of ass. I was, I had game. I was like, when I was in the hood, street dude, so drug, I always had game. I always had women. Most of those guys in the porn industry didn't really have a lot of game if it wasn't brought to them as far as the sex. So say for instance, you had a, like I had a, I had a girlfriend. Dudes were still trying to hook. They, they wasn't enough for them to have sex on a set. They're still trying to hook up with your girl because they, that's their ego and everybody's so cutthroat. So my thing was always kept her professional Girls like that, they trusted me. I would give girls, you know, give them a ride to the set, you know, stop by, you know, if girls need a ride. A lot of these girls made money but had no car. They basically, uh, you know, had roommates and um, all the guys were hitting on them. So they were always, you know, when you were a good guy, they they, they showed genuine trust. They're like, oh, Big Herc, he's always cool. He looks out. Because a lot of these dudes are perms, man. And literally, they're pressing these girls like, dude, she came here to work. Let her work and go home. You know what I mean? Give her some respect, man. And so that industry is just a really grimy industry, and a lot of those guys in there are grimy. Wow. That's a lot. That's really guys. Oh, by the way, you're not a rapper, right? That's Herc with a K. No, no, Herc with a C. So oh. like, big, like Big Hercules. No, but that's you. But the, the, the Herc with a K, that's a rapper, apparently, because oh, a lot yeah, of people yeah, think yeah. you're that's a rapper. from Detroit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's Guys, I, I gotta, I gotta. This is fa amazing and it's fascinating. But I, I have to point to some comments for one moment. Uh, yeah. I, I want to go back, Marcus. You're getting so many comments, man, and it's all good, good stuff, <laughs> except for one guy. I don't think. Look, we've got some really good fans, man, and the fan base is growing every week. Like Bo True might be our number one fan, and this guy's like giving us nothing but love and positivity here. Bo, thank you. And then we have Ashley Batiste. This is 20 minutes ago now. Says Transformers looking for an open palm strike. Now that's got to be a reference to you, boss, because I'd like to see this too. For the first time on Talking Tough, I'm calling out one of our fans because this guy is a fucking retard. I'm sorry. I'm doing it. You guys probably won't like this. Sean's going to reprimand me later. I see it already. But <laughs> first of all, Ashley Batiste says Transformers looking for an open palm strike. Well, this guy's got his name spelled wrong, M.O. Transformers. Now, we were talking about dumb people before. This guy takes a cake, man. He's Marcus, you converted You converted to being a Muslim now because I guess that's what happens to black people when they leave prison, right? Um, this is guy. And he's on our ass because the real crime here is that we're asking for money for this stream. Now, I don't think we ever asked anybody for a penny. I know I haven't made a penny on this. Maybe Sean's making all the money. I don't know. No. <laughs> we're, right now, we're working towards that end. We're trying to provide for stories. It's called Talking Tough because, look, I mean, Big Herc, you come, it sounds like you come out on the other side. Again, the, the porn industry, uh, bank robbing industry, the prison industry, uh, robbing and stealing, it never ends good for the majority of the people that participate. You sound like a very intelligent individual doing motivational speaking. It sounds like you're recalling it almost like when it was actually happening, you, when you were telling me, and I was right there with you in that car when the freaking canine pulled up, yeah. it, has to, it, it never leaves you, right? We're everything that we were in our youth as adults. And the only thing we can do is regurgitate it, put some perspective on it, and try to share it with guys out there so they don't make the same mistakes. And so they also recognize their life after. What are you doing now? Uh, you got a half a million people on your YouTube channel. But what are you doing now to try to ensure that these kids are hearing your message? What, what resonates with people when you talk about your history that they won't do what you did? They won't make the same mistakes that you made. I know you didn't have that father figure you wanted, but you're 46, 48 years old. How do you stop the next guy from being a little hurt? 
Sean, well, Sean, it's a, it's another great question, and I was going to ask Marcus exactly those same questions, and and I'll, I'll shut up in a second and go back to Sean, and then into Marcus. Uh, obviously, Sean didn't like what I was doing to our fan because you you cut me off, shut me down. Yeah. Which is I appreciate that. <laughs> I do it to you all the time. So turn, turn about is fair play. But here's where I was going with that. Okay. We're not making money on this. I just say, why don't we charge this guy a hundred bucks to donate to a charity, or else we'll just block him. But what I was going to say at the end was this. I would like an MO Transformers. I want to invite you, please. Come log back on on your real name and ask Marcus a question, man. This guy has a lot of wisdom to share. Show us who you are. And why don't we become your friends or you become ours? Because that's what this podcast is you know, about. I, I learned a few things here, Rick. And you, you never argue with an idiot. You know why? Because they drag you down to their level and they're going to beat you with experience. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just trying to make this guy one of us. Yes. That's one of him. <laughs> anyway, please continue. That's a great question, Sean. Marcus, please. Um, well, I have two channels. I have Fresh Out which I talked to guys. Um, we've had, you know, our show kicked off with Kelly Muscle. He was our first guy we interviewed. And, um, you know, seven years ago, eight years ago. And since then, we've had hundreds of people. Uh, some never been to prison, very successful. And it's, it's life lessons, man. So yeah. when you listen and having people intimately tell the story, because nobody glamorizes. It's not my, my channel. not like the other prison channels. Yeah, man. This guy, he got raped, and then he put a knife in, and he did this. We don't talk about That's not what this is about. My thing is, like, if I was a little hurt, and I could sit down and talk to an older male and get some knowledge, yeah, what would I want? What would, what would, what would penetrate me, you know, to where I would listen and take, take heed? And so I try to share that in my, in my, in my interviews, and even on my own YouTube channel, which is Big Herc 916, which is more of me just having spiritual like insights. Mm -hmm. So I had two mentors in prison, an older black guy and an older white guy. And both of them taught me a lot. And they and they and they broke down my ego, broke down a lot of the pain I had. Anger. I had a lot of anger, man. I had a lot of just wanting to prove this, this, you know, who I am. For no, re for no reason, even though I have so much uh, more potential. So when I think about young kids who are in pain, maybe through having a horrible parent, a dad who never said, I love you, a mom who's on drugs, or maybe, you know, no, so not nobody who cares or maybe they're having these different voices or thoughts in their mind and they don't know how to kind of like counter them. I'm trying to tell you you have multiple choices. You have so many options. It's limitless, man. I mean, literally, there's so many different things you could do. I mean, I look at myself. Porn, selling drugs, bank robbery. I had a Series 23. I sold limited gas partnerships. I've been on a private jet. I, you know, I've traveled to Japan to do adult movies. I've done commercials. I've done movies and regular movies. I've done all these different things, but I didn't know how to find direction. So by me putting out my videos, I have over, we have over 280 million views. And there's kids from all around the world who have said, watching your videos, I started my own business, hurt because of you, I got into crypto and I'm, I'm man, I'm, I'm killing it. Or, you know what, I, I started, I went back to school, you know, I contemplated suicide, your, your videos helped me out a rough time because I've been there. I've yeah. been there where... I didn't know where I was going to live at. I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I try to convey that. And, and I feel like we're all energy. We're, we're all like connected by less than two degrees. Mm -hmm. And if I can put a message out and, and operate on a certain frequency, I can bring up your frequency. So that's why I always live my conversations in my free time to people who are high frequency people. I do not talk to idiots on the street. Fools, I do not. I'm invisible. You know, I could drive through South Central, MLK, Slossons, and I'm invisible because I've, I'm frequently on a higher level. So I put my videos out with a frequency vibration that's so high. And that's why my videos aren't like some of these rappers, because I'm not doing that. I'm not bringing that in. I'm, I'm, I'm weeding that out. So yeah. the kids who gravitate towards me, they feel my message and I'm helping them. Parents watching with my kid with their kids. I had the guy who 
the guy who was working the day I robbed the bank, I was doing a live stream one time that the sheriff in Ventura County, he said, man, I remember getting a call when you guys robbed the bank and I was going to, I was, I was going to secure the perimeter. And now I'm watching you on YouTube, man, that was 20 years ago, dude, I'm so proud of you. Yeah, Man, that makes a difference, man. I'm not yep. just guys from the street. Law enforcement, give me props. I've had guys in law, you know, federal prisons email me that they show my videos to guys in prison. And to me, that feels good because I'm not pretending. I'm not no, Rick knows me. I don't try to be no tough guy. I never was like, you know, a guy who tried to act like something I wasn't. I'm just being me, man. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how I am all the time. And so I, I spill my heart out of my mm -hmm. videos and I feel in the process, the universe blesses me and so be it. But I can never sell myself out and I can never be one of those dudes who is pretentious and not genuine. And I like to see people win, man. Is there something that you 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 you're looking for now, like something that you didn't accomplish yet because you did so much? I, I mean, you get up every day in the morning. I guess you know this is your job, changing lives for people. But is there something else that you say, okay, I really would like to do that? That will be the icing on the cake. Um, I, I think as far as what I look forward to doing is having, uh, is being able to have more resources to travel to other places to actually have those experiences as a point of reference. Um, you know, be able to go to different parts of the world I haven't been to. Being able to have a conversation with, you know, people like yourself in different genres so they, they can get a perspective because there's a lot of false perspectives on, on especially this. You know, it's so stupid, ignorant, man. I mean, so I like to, I like to, I, I go places a lot of times that I'm, I'm one of the minorities and I love having conversations because people are like, Dude, they, they try to figure you out just like your anomaly. Like, you know, what is it about? And then when they find out, they're like, man, I, you know, I, I couldn't believe you. You've done all this stuff. And it's like, how'd you get there? How'd you get there? So when I try to explain to people and break it down, I think it gives me an edge on helping other kids to figure out why they went wrong. Why they make bad choices. Why do people make bad choices? And I wasn't, you know, doing it to get money for drugs. It wasn't like I was living on the streets. It was, you know, it's like, why did I do that? And like you said, Sean, it wasn't the bank. It was all those other choices, those things that I hadn't addressed, you know, that I needed time to reflect. You need time to, you know, meditate and look at your life. A lot of people never look at their life. That's why they explode. They they get involved in all these different things. And they're not even locked up, but they're, they're, they're institutionalized. Yeah. Whether it's drugs on the street, alcohol on the street, sex a lot of guys are addicted to you know i see guys in the point i'm like i had a bad you know these guys are people get caught up and it's like dude they have no control over their vices so my whole thing is mastering self and once you can master self dude the universe you can pull whatever you want from it it's, it's yeah. there whatever you need if you're hungry to give you food yeah. you, need, you know what i mean if, if everything's there but you have to first master all these things and those are things that we think are just there, but those things are trying to pull us so that we can't ever reach that highest self. Yeah, which I like about counselors because, I mean, at the end of the day, we're all for, we're actually counselors because what we talk about, we actually live. And you have to hear it from somebody that's actually been there and done that to know the pitfalls, the benefits. I mean, there's no benefits going to prison other than you can turn in or, and find your inner self. And, and, and find out what's really important when you get out, you realize you don't want to go back. I mean, you may be that catalyst that prevents people from ever going in because you're able to talk from a point of reference. You were in. I mean, yeah. you, you were in jail for bank robbery. I don't have a friend on the planet that, that's gone to jail for bank robbery. So for me to kind of hear you talk about that, um, that's something that I think you continually sharing your story it will prevent people from wanting to, to go there. That's the end result. Very few people get away, right? I mean, when you get away, how much is in that bag? It's not going to be something that carries you into the next life. No. no. Uh, it, it, once you split it up, there were three of you guys. I'm sure, look, if it was $300,000, $100,000, isn't going to go very far. No. And then no, you're going to probably it in, and this time you might get killed, right? I mean, you can't no, outrun it's, the helicopter. You're not going to outrun the dog. But that time, that time, Herc, from beginning to end, how much time are you in jail? Eight, eight years, eight months. months. Eight, I mean, eight minutes. I think of eight minutes in, in, a, in a jail cell. I feel like I'm missing everything, especially in the digital age, right? I mean, and kids growing up, 
and events happening in the world to having that freedom taken away for eight years sounds like an eternity. I know just listening to you talk, it's a place that you would never go back to. You know, and it's, it's a false reality because I'm fortunate, man. I was strong enough not to get pulled into a lot of bullshit. But a lot of dudes, you know, Sean, they go to prison, bro. They're they're compelled to click up. And, dude, you go in here and something happens, man. You might have stab it. You might not make it out, man. Yeah. There's dudes, you don't make it. Dudes, rise, kick off. Dude, stab you in the neck. You bleed out. I mean, dude, there's a lot of, there's a lot of ifs. There's a lot of ifs, man. And there's a lot of politics. Even if you're, even if you are clicked up, sometimes people get in there and then somebody says you're no good. Now somebody's got to remove you. Yeah. I mean, dude, there's all type of it, what ifs in there. Yeah. And so my thing was, I try to become a Jedi in prison to kind of play chess so far ahead that I never made those mistakes again. So I didn't lose my freedom even more yeah. because there's no talking. A lot of those guys, man. You cannot ration now with somebody at that low of a frequency, man. It's it's like talking to a trying to commute, commute, talk to a a lion in the in the jungle, bro. But he's gonna eat you. He's gonna eat you. You know. So it's like there's there's so many other elements, and it's just a false reality what what they project. Nobody rapping, doing music. Nobody. It's all you're never you're you would never rob you would never rob a bank. So why even put that thought? And I'm looking at the programming now and all that stuff. It's like entertainment cool but there's a difference between entertainment and, and reality i see young people man coming in there on my way out that you know were caught up in all this stuff drugs partying robbing stuff and once they get to prison see the first two years you're part you're cool 21 22 oh man dude once you get in there 10 years yeah. 15 years you got a serious you know a serious sentence dude your grandpa you start thinking man it's not the same to you when you're young you feel invincible these rapper, oh man, this and that. But dude, to, to, to get to be 20, most got 21, 22, 19, 24 to get a 30 year sentence, 50 years, and the fans, you do 85%. Yeah. 85%, wow. man. Yeah. No joke, bro. And to <clears throat> me, bro, it's 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 what they're what they're doing right now is sad and they glamorize <clears throat> it. And if I talk more about oh man, doing this and Bob, man, I have over two million subscribers. My channel will be off the chain, but I don't talk. I don't. I don't promote that. And somebody told me one time we were trying to sell our show to get it on a major platform, and they said, uh, "Herc, man, you got a great show, but you glamorize prison." I'm like, "What are you talking about, man?" Yeah, idiots again, right? He said, "Well, you everybody you show on your channel is successful. They got jobs. They're doing well. What about the guy who's about to go back? We need to see those guys. You got to throw them in there because." That makes the show interesting and people can see because nobody they don't want to see you come out and win. Yeah. And, yep. and, 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 and for the system to work, prisons is a private industry. Everybody, all the a lot of these top politicians got investments in them. They if they were empty, bro, they their stock would be worth nothing. Right. Those private prisons, they make stuff for the military, they make clothing products, they make uh some of them make desks uh, uh, for Home Depot. All these stuff, man, they make a lot of money off of prison labor. Right. Whacking the Hut, um, uh, uh, some of these other, other prison industrial fund. It's all tied in. So when they say reform, they really don't want people to not be going to prison because it would mean a void. But you could actually flip it. If you actually took that money and put it into the communities and gave a lot of these kids whose dads are locked up or not around, more of a mentorship program, dude. We could change. We could change the economy. We could change the economy. But prison, man, they're not. There's no reform in there, man. Unless you reform yourself. Well, I can tell you, I, I, I'm from Orange County, and throughout my entire curriculum, we never had someone from prison come in and speak to us. Which I think it's a rite of passage. Like we should have that conversation, so we know. You know, you have the sex education, right? And no one's telling us about the other side, what can happen if you screw up. And that would be nice to hear in high school, right? I mean, that's a great place to hear from someone about prison that's been to prison. I think it's almost like we, we're actually, we put together um, a master course on that, on as far as how to survive in jail. And we're trying to get it into like some of the curriculums in order to be a deterrent. Yeah, deterrent. scared straight 
It's not about scare straight, man. It's about options. And you say Orange County. I graduated from Marina. I went to. Okay. I lived in. I lived in Huntington for two years, but it wasn't enough for me to grasp how blessed I was. Yeah. You know I mean, when I was in Huntington, I felt like I was, dude, I, an alien. I was one of three black kids. I mean, I, I felt I, I, it's hard to make friends. All these kids had money. I was going there by default, and it, it's like it was the, the the worst two years of my life, going from junior to you know my last two years of high school because I, I didn't know how I didn't that, that environment was it was foreign to me. But as I went got older, and when I was in prison, I thought about all my experiences in Huntington. I'm like, man, that place was man, it was cool at the beach surfing yeah, i'm like god damn it man why didn't i just stay there yeah. so it, it's like i didn't really understand it man as a person coming from sacramento where i came from to there and so i say that to say that being exposed to certain things it, it, it broadens your horizon and a lot of guys i was in prison they used to tell me man you know hey man you you know you ever had a white girlfriend you ever dated a mexican i'm like yeah you had white friends on the street yeah Where'd you live at, man? How you know white dudes on the street? They used to trip out. They yeah. just don't be, dude, that's how messed up our country is. Dude, a lot of people have never talked to a white person on the street. They've never talked to a Mexican dude. I had a Mexican celly in prison, and dudes would be like, man, why you know that Mexican? I'm like, dude, that's my homeboy. We're from the same city. Man, you know the Mexican. You better watch out. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's yeah. how messed up our country is. It, it's it, Most people are in a bubble. They haven't had exposure, and they're just limited. As even though they live in a country to free, but they haven't had that experience, man. And and I and I. So me, I have. I've had Mexican. I've had white. I've had skinhead. I've had ex gang members. I've had all these people. When I go places in public, I'm able to go anywhere because people like Big Herc, man, you're a real one. I talk to everybody. I know guys from the top three motorcycle one percent gangs. They're all cool with me because I'm a real dude, man. And that's my message. I think is is sharing my story to help open up and, and, and bridge these gaps in society. Yeah. Powerful. Wow. Very powerful, buddy. Marcus, you're Very making cool. a lot of fans here tonight. I see that. I think Boss Rutten and Sean Ray are, are probably two new fans, I, I would I would dare say. No and the, the comments that are like, wow, people amazing comments, including many like this. I wish every young person out there now could listen to this. And I know you do this now, Marcus. This is your life, a, a ministry even, if you will, and it's amazing. You know and I know, we all know, young people have really notoriously short attention spans these days. You know, they come up with this, right? This has been a great hour, hour and a quarter almost already. If this is one minute, if you had a y youngster's attention for one minute and this person was going the wrong way, whatever that looks like, what can you tell them to get to get someone started back on the right path in a minute? If that's, I'm putting you on the spot, and I know that, but I'm just curious what the what the short elevator pitch to that is, if there's such a thing. You know, I would I would always ask myself. I said, man, you consider yourself a loser. Who wants to be a loser in life? You know, I always had high expectations of myself, and to the point where I was scared to fail. You know, I was an all or nothing guy, either. I'm going to make it to the top or nothing. I don't want secondary. I don't want a participation trophy. I'm an all or nothing. So when I tell a youngster, where do you see yourself at? And I, I, I try to I try to convey to them, always strive to be the best you can be. There's something about you. The reason you exist is because God said you have a purpose. And whatever that is, your goal in life is to find whatever that is. It might take you years before you figure out you're the best goddamn violinist on the planet. Maybe you're the best guy who, who can, you know, uh, pick out insects in the world. There's something you're great at, but you have to figure that out. And if you don't pursue that, your life's a waste. You've wasted your life. Like Sean said, I could be in a cell thinking, man, what could I be doing right now? Why am I in here? What is my purpose? If I, if I figure this out already, why am I still here? Right. And I could beat myself in the head. And I didn't have any business while I was in prison, bro. I did eight years, eight months with no family visits. And I think dope fiends get visits in prison. So I should be in there like, what type of person was I to be in a position like this, to be isolated from the world with no outside contact and to get out and still try to be successful? I had a lot to prove, man. 
So I tell people, man, you know, what are you what are you doing out here to be who you're supposed to be? What's your purpose, man? You want to be a loser? I never want to be no loser. Period. Who wants to? I mean, if you're cool with being a loser, and then I, I can't help you. Plain and yep. simple, bro. Go be a loser. Get the hell out of my face. I think that runs somebody through. holler at me. That, that sounds like a common theme with all of our guests in terms of their high functioning performance uh, in the sports that we do and, and the guys that have come on and talked. Some of us have succumbed to certain things that have sidetracked us, whether it was through injury or even through success. It's very easy to get sidetracked when you're sitting on top, right? I mean, you don't you don't ever think you're going to go back down again. You just think you're going to stay on the top, and, and all these things that are given to you can consume you and take you off your game, and then you wake up and you got to regroup and you got to come out on the other side, which I think it's a running theme through our show is that most of our guests have been – up here riding high um, and then have fallen and have found their way back through a mature way, independent of each other. I mean, through all the pain and the injuries and addictions and all the, the that stuff kind of shapes us who we are now. And it's interesting because the majority of our guests are 50 ish and we all sound very much like we're, we're better off trying to pour it ourselves into other people listening then try to, to dwell on the successes that we had in the past when we were young. We didn't get a really a good chance to enjoy our success because we were too busy doing what we were doing. Like, you know, I, I'm more amazed listening to people tell me how impressed they were with my success when I was on top. I, when I was on top, I wasn't really paying attention. Now I hear someone tell me about my story and I think, wow, yeah, I did do all those things. But I get more satisfaction out of somebody saying, hey, I listened to you, I watched you, I followed your routine. And you're inspiring me. And that stuff, that, that's the only thing that really makes me feel good these days. And, and I hear the same thing when you're talking to her about trying to pour yourself into these other young kids coming up. Because, look, all you need to do is save one. One person yeah. is you. That's all you need. And, you know, you made a good point, Sean, because you know what, man? A lot of times as men, alpha males, we don't want to feel weak. Mm -hmm. We don't want to feel like we, we doubt ourselves and we can't <laughs> make it. And so for myself, it's like, when I found my mentor and I was able to talk, but you can't cry in prison. You can't cry. You got to be tough, but you get these these conversations and it's like, damn, you know, it feels good to get it out because you don't have your father or somebody you can really talk real man talk with. You, you hold in a lot of things. You think something's wrong with you. Maybe you're the only one who feels like this, but there's other alpha males who feel the same way. And so when you can have these discussions, it's not showing your weakness. It's showing that you're human. And we build from this and you grow. And I think that's what a lot of kids need to hear and to grow also because it's like a tree grows and you trim it and then it grows again and trim it and grows. And we need that as men to have this feedback from each other because you don't get it. A lot of times, man, you know, I can be like, damn, and I have maybe two friends I can talk to and really be open with. Otherwise, a lot of dudes look, oh, man, Sean, he's soft, man. He was talking about, dude, it ain't being soft. It ain't, you know, I'm saying? just because I talk about this is, this is some real shit, but you know, sometimes you got to get it out. If you don't get it out, sometimes it can fester inside you and it can do other things. So having groups and people who are strong, being able to share to other youngsters who are trying to figure themselves out, this makes all the difference in the world right here. This little type, this little platform you got going, man. Yeah. Thank you for that, Marcus, man. That's really cool. Coming from you, especially. We, we appreciate that. Um, man. I, I wouldn't know how to wrap this up. You, I, I knew you would be an incredibly great guest on the show, and you exceeded the expectations I had. Were pretty yep. high. Um, it, it's really cool for me to, like, to sit back and look at Sean Ray and Boss Rutten and now Big Herc together. And, uh, and Sean, you're uh, great questions, man. I'm learning yep. to do everything. I appreciate that. I really yeah. do. Um, Marcus, before we let you go, um, is there anything that you want to know from Boss Rutten and Sean Ray? Well, man, I, I'm fans of both, man. I mean, I was the OG when I got out of YA, OG fan watching MMA back in the day when they had, um, you know, when they were still fighting in the old octagon with Hoyce Gracie and stuff, man. I mean, you know, it, it always inspired me. And like I said, I grew up reading Muscle and Fitness, dreaming of one day becoming a bodybuilder. And I remember, you know, Sean was always the top, top dude up there, you know. And so I would, was always trying to – but. I was so far removed from a lot of that. So my thing was always fantasy through visual. 
You know, yeah. I didn't have anybody really grooming me. I never had nobody really telling me anything. So I used to just try shit. And, you know, as I said, it's, you know, I look up to both of you guys, but being able to, like, actually converse with you now, I think, you know, having this, having social media, it's changed the game because a lot of people who can, who can normally even talk to you guys, just who, you know, back in the day, you had to write fan mail and send it in, and you might get a picture back with your, your little, you know, photo with you doing your double bot. But now it's like, dude, that's that's powerful, man. That's powerful stuff, you know. And uh, I, I'm just blessed to even be able to sit down and have you guys. Because, like I said, I mean, you know, Rick invited me, and uh, I, 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 you know, just being able to share conversation, bro. I, I would have never thought that in a, in a hundred years I'd be sitting here talking with either one of you guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, hats off to Rick for putting the platform together for us. And, yeah. And uh, getting these great guests, some of which we've never met before and, and would never meet in a million years. Uh, I'm learning every day that we bring on one of these guests. And it's uh, it, it, your, your testimony is going to resonate. Uh, and hopefully we can bring you back on again down the road and see how things are progressing for you as well. You have a website? You have a website? Or, uh, yeah, yeah. I got a website, BigHurt916.com and okay. also FreshOutSeries.com. And we have all our stuff on there, merch, videos. Um, a lot of positive messages, man. And, um, like we're just trying to, you know, help all these young people, man. Hopefully, you know, like you said, we can't save them all, Sean, but we get one or two, yeah. you know, the ones that are here, the message they're meant to hear. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And I want to, I want to give a, a, a big pump up to, to the fresh out series on YouTube. I, I t- typically avoid YouTube like the plague, but I like your series, man. It's really cool. And everybody out there, if you haven't seen it, Check it out. It's like the best blend of real life information and entertainment all at the same time. So keep up. Keep up the great work, man. And, you know, so happy for your success, Marcus. And just looking forward to watching you just blow up and blow up, man. It's really cool. Thank you, Rick. And it's been a great, I mean, dude, you were one of the first people I met when I got out. I mean, I was out maybe, I was still written a room when I met you, bro. I was I was still trying to get on my feet, man. So, I mean, dude, it's, it's been a blessing having you as a friend. Likewise, Mark. So good to see you. And let's be in touch. For sure, man. Thank you, my friend. That's big hurt, Marcus. Marcus. What a story. Good to see oh. you. <laughs> and Boston Sean. Boston Sean, hold on. Hold on, guys. Um, okay. Why don't you stay with us for a minute? Let's, uh, let's, let's get to a couple of comments because we're getting a lot today. And... I always take flack from the producers for not answering our producers who are great for not, uh, not, you know, giving props to some of our, our viewers and some of the questions I, I wanted to just point out, it's not a question here, but a gentleman identifying, identifying himself as board Bordington yeah. just walked off four and a half years in was blessed enough to be uh, in the second chance program, went from eighth grade dropout to earning my AA with a 3.93 GPA. It's possible to change. That's yeah, great. You know, huh. and, and and I love stuff like that. Um, the, you know, he's painting a picture where, you know, he never was at the top of the world, but now he is. And that's great. So, board, thank you. We appreciate Congratulations. that. Congratulations. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, man, so many people are just like saying hello to you guys, giving you props. Uh, there's a lot of questions here. There's a lot of great comments. Um, David Rich. Can these guys answer our questions? Absolutely. We'd love to. Um, what I'm seeing, though, are a lot of comments. So if you have a question for us, throw it out. We will do our very best to get to it. Absolutely. Um, things like, what's up? Hey, man, David Rich again. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyway, there, there's not a lot of questions. Tons of comments. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And before we go, I, you know, I would like to find out from you guys, what's happening? Boss, what's going on in your, your world these days. Oof. Ah, no, you know, still, still, my focus is still on the you know, the trainer of being uh, putting a, lo- a bunch of them together. So uh, making videos for that, you know, just posting another one on Instagram, and you know that that's pretty much eating all my time. And of course, our dog, because I love our dog, we have uh, a lot of good times. I went to a show last Friday with an actor, Gabriel Basso. He's a friend of mine. Uh, he's a great actor. He was in the Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, he was the brother that they wrote a story about. Um, and this guy is such an incredible talent. It, it's amazing. Like the first time I train him, I, I look at my wife and she says, how is he? I go, he's like me, but way better. <laughs> I mean, he's freaking insane. He picks up immediately and he goes, why doesn't everybody explain it like you do? Because it makes so much sense. And 
So he had his first fight. So he comes off a movie set for two and a half months. He has 10 days. He calls me the day before. And he says, hey, is there a way that he can do a fight? Because I'm going to have another movie like in three weeks. I said, let me look for a fight. So we find a, find a show. But the only guy that he can fight is a guy who had seven fights, four already on paper, and then three other ones that, that we heard of. And he's 6'5", but he's 185. And nobody wants to fight the guy. So this promoter tells me, he says, you, you sure you want to do that? I say, yeah, I think he's going to be okay because – we all know you, you can be really good in the gym, but it doesn't mean, matter, uh, mean if you can do it under pressure, right? It's a complete uh, different animal. But I said, so that's what we're trying to figure out, you know, uh, to, just to see how he is. I think he's going to be okay because he's used in big acting, you know, and under pressure performing and thinking, and that is acting. So I think he will be okay. And boy, did he deliver, man. He, um, first of all, he hit his hand also, hurt his hand four days before, couldn't hit with the right. So he was only training with his left hand the whole time, still wanted to fight. I'm already cutting weight, he said. I said, otherwise I didn't for nothing. I don't want to do it. And he went over there and I said, go, okay, don't hit him with the right hand to the head because it might hurt your hand even more. But go for the body because I know he he's the hardest punch I've ever felt at 185. It's like he hurts my arms when he's hitting me. It's like an incredible power. And uh, sure enough, he drops me with the right body shot straight to the body, gets an eight count. And the second one is a combination I love a lot, a big left hook. And you make a telegraph it so, so they block it. And it will open, clearing the path to the body again. And the second time that uh, uh, he, he didn't come up, <laughs> the, the fight was over. So hey. for a fighter, the first fight to win by body shot, that I, I want to see how many people, how many fighters did that. Because the, yeah, your brutal. mind, when that's you're brutal. fighting, you only want to go for the head, head, head. That's what your mind tells you to do. You think the body's not going to work, you know, but he kept his composure. And then he comes up with the song, La money, la, 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 la. He comes up with that song, the whole people go, what yeah. is <laughs> And boss, so, it was a really great night. What's the, up, what's the update on the O2 trainer? O2 trainer is going great. Uh, everything is going great. Uh, we were sending him out a lot. I had a really cool message from Leota Machida, who apparently came out of COVID, and he left me a voice message. And he's been doing it for four months straight, and he's one of these guys that once he builds a habit, he keeps doing it. Yep. And he goes, dude, I have no clue what's going on. I'm, 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 I just had COVID last week. I'm training with my guys who are like 10, 15 years younger than me. And he says, nobody has my stamina. I just That's plow amazing. through. He says, the thing is freaking insane. So uh, to, coming from him, that was a really nice uh, message for me. So, yeah. And now I got another guy. He just uh, ordered a whole bunch already. He's a pulmonologist who won six awards with the AARP for pulmonology. And, uh, and he is big on the online breathing. And he has, we're talking 30,000 uh, clients, you know, that he's, that he's all streams. And uh, and he bought, bought the first whole set because he's, he swears by it, the old model already he loved, and for his COPD and for his asthma patients. So I think once that is going to come out for real, like with the guy, I'm saying something, and they can look him up and see who he really is, I think he's going to do a lot of good for the product. And I know, uh, great. I know a lot of people that, that watch the show were wanting to get an O2 trainer. How how can they get their trainer? O2trainer.com. Just Google it and uh, that book by the big by the boom, boss root and breathing device. <laughs> Anything will pop up right away. So uh, get it. Finally available. I, I know I do this every time I bring it up. Right there, baby. I've been using it every day. Go. I love it. You see? It's good stuff. And Sean. What's going yeah. on with you, my friend? What's going on? I mean, I'm just working on this, the, the classes, bro. I'm I'm out of here on Tuesday. My days are numbered as I prepare to head off to Hawaii. Right? Woo! Look at you. Look at that man. That's a nice that's graphic, man. man. That's really that's giant. cool. Oh, that's badass. So this is the official book with all the athletes and all the expenses and, and all the good stuff. So that's my master book right there. I'm heading out on Tuesday. The whole family's coming behind me on Wednesday. So it's going to be a, a, a nice week of R&R &R right before we head into the, the Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, Boss, while I have you here, were you able to watch the Kuzman uh, Covington fight over the weekend? Oh, dude, insane, right? I yeah. Mean, the, the, the first fight, right? Gage <laughs> versus Chandler. And I knew it. You know, you, oh, okay, well, oh, this, I, I completely, you see, uh, this is how crazy I am. I had the UFC here at my house. We were filming, they were filming the UFC fight night, the watch party. <laughs> Okay. So I had my daughters here and their boyfriends who are both big MMA fans, so they knew a lot. And they come here and then they film you reacting to the screen and they do that with like five other people and they make a whole thing about it on, on Fight Pass. Nice. So that was so kind of cool. So when we watched the fight, I go like, well, 
that first fight, that's going to set the bar really high. There's going to be fight of the night for sure, I said. And boy, I wasn't wrong, but I think everybody with a half a brain could have known that this guy I missed was Nami Yunus. I missed Nami Yunus. Was that a good fight? With the oh, she's, she's so her footwork and the composure, and you know, she was just picking her apart. It was a close fight. Her opponent, Zhang, is an unbelievable fighter as well. But Rose is, uh, oh man, Thug Rose, she fits that name. She's very calm, relaxed. And like yeah. I said, her distance. I, I, I think her distance is better at her footwork than a lot of professional guys. And let me tell I'm you gonna that. Watch that tonight on, I'm going to watch that tonight on YouTube. And Rick, what, do you have a birthday coming up or something here? Or you're coming to California, aren't you? Yeah, we're going to be like two planes who cross in the night, man. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I am. I'm head boss. You're going to get a kick out of this when I get to it. I'm leaving tomorrow. My birthday is 10 days from now. I'm on the red eye out tomorrow night. I already missed my dogs. 10 days away from them. I'm going to go nuts. But Oof. it has to happen. There's a party in San Diego, a birthday party that I'm going to on Saturday night. You're going to love this, boss. And Sean, as an old school wrestling fan, you may get a kick out of this. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine is throwing a birthday party for himself and his friend in his backyard. Now, he called me. He goes, Rick, I want to enjoy my own party. Will you, like, come out and kind of just run it for me so I can – Enjoy it? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. In the backyard is this. There's two famous comedians performing. The final performance is uh, by Uncle Cracker, if you know who that is. And then before that, there's a pro wrestling show. And there's a ton of named pro wrestlers coming for this in this guy's backyard. And there's a, in, in the final match, it's a five against five tag team match. And here's some of the people in it. The Godfather, Greg the Hammer Valentine, uh, Hornswoggle, the little dude, and Boss. Here's three more guys in this 10-man tag match. Mark Coleman, Don Fry, and Chuck Liddell. And Whoa! Oh, 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 Exactly. <laughs> I'm checking out with my, with my freaking four neck surgeries. No, thank yeah. you. My I didn't think you wanted well. any part of that, boss. I, I don't blame you, man. Ooh, that's an injury <laughs> waiting to happen. That yeah, but Sean, my birthday is November 20th. I'm turning 60. I have a slug of meetings. It's a business trip. I have a cameo meetings all week long. I get to have lunch with Lee Steinberg, probably the most famous sports agent of all time. Um, you know, I have quite an itinerary set up. Friday night cameo, and my good friend there, Matt Devine, who runs the music department, is throwing me a birthday party, a cameo-sponsored party. And, boss, I believe you're coming to that. I understand. Yes, uh, which is yep. great. And then um, the final night, my actual birthday, is a smaller dinner in Orange County with old, old friends and Back here with my dogs, and I'm excited. Life is good. Things are going well. I'm healthy, and I get to talk to you guys every week. How, how's your nutrition coming along, there, Sean? How is the nutrition line going? So uh, we're all in. They're going to be coming out from Canada to the Hawaii show. Um, I'm actually working on presenting uh, an opportunity before the end of the year where someone could win a free trip to the Arnold Classic, which returns in March in Ohio. So constantly promoting the brand. The pre-workout is going through the roof and now we're taking it off to Hawaii so, to share it with the Hawaiians out there. So there's a lot going on. We're going to close out the year very strong. Um, next Wednesday, uh, I, I don't know that I'll be available to make the show. Did you have the guest already, Rick, for next Wednesday? We do have a guest next Wednesday. And I, let me let me tell you quickly about a couple of guests we have coming up. Uh, <laughs> The guest next Wednesday is Sean. You, you may, you're probably not familiar with him. Somebody boss, I believe, has met. It's one of my best friends ever in the world. His name is Tom Howard. And boss, do you know Tom? Yeah, you know I know Tom. Tom. Yeah. He's a fascinating yeah. guy, Sean. Yeah. This, this, yeah. Talk about multi hyphenates. This guy was, well, he's a wrestler in every major organization there was with no fights under his belt. His first MMA fight ever was on New Year's Eve for K1 in front of 70,000 people. And he fought uh, eight high-level pro fights in a very short period of time. The guy was a head trainer at my wrestling school. So he's the guy who stars in the, the best wrestling training series ever, in which Samoa Joe, John Cena, and Christopher Daniels were his students. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's just known as like the Zen master in the wrestling world. He's got his head on right. Uh, everyone looks up to him. He's a scary-looking dude, but couldn't be a nicer guy on this planet. And just a, a fascinating individual. That's Tom Howard. The following week, Sean, and I hope you're back for this one, is a gentleman by the name of Emmanuel Jal. Now, mm -hmm. do you guys ever hear the term the Lost Boys of the Sudan? They were the child soldiers from the Civil War in Sudan back about 25 years ago. Right. And Emmanuel is a guy at nine years old. 
He saw his mother and his sister literally raped to death before his eyes. Right. And he was taken out of his village by, by the rebels. He was addicted to drugs, which they did to the kids, turned into a killing machine. Uh, by the time he was 14, he was rescued and repatriated. He has no memory of how many people he killed himself, but he knows it was a lot. That's his number. Now, 25 years later, Emmanuel Jaw is an unbelievable recording artist who, uh, who is all about peace and love and spreading compassion. He has an incredibly successful meditation app, if you can believe that, that's sweeping the world. And this guy is like truly one of the happiest, brightest people I've ever met in my life. And talk about a story. Wow. So that's well, Emmanuel Jaw. And that's that'll be the day before Thanksgiving. I'll be here. I'll be back. So let's do it. All right. All right. Yeah, great hey guys, guest. Thank you. Great job as always. It was a lot of fun, man. What a guest. Oh, man. Big Herc. Big that, Herc. Was, that was some crazy. I mean, we, we almost didn't ask anything. I mean, it was so. The time, I was looking at the time, and suddenly it goes like, that means an hour has passed. Yeah, this is great. crazy. I mean, it was insane. We could another hour with him. Yeah, easy. So, yeah, no, very powerful. And I, I love stories like that. That's also with our next guest. I, I love that as well. So uh, you're doing a great job, Rick. Thank you. Guys, right. so good to see you. Best of success this week, Sean. Boss, right. see, you. see you in L.A. Godspeed, brother. Oh, God. Whoa. Yeah, guys. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Take care, brother.